I'm Leslie McIntosh, and I'm going to be the moderator for this. I am a professor at Washington University, and I also have founded and oversee the St. Louis Machine Learning and Data Science Meetup, which is free to attend if anyone's interested. But we're going to have each of the panelists here introduce themselves. And before I forget, this is also sponsored by 1904 Labs. And we had a slide, but everybody should have in their um, possession it, one of these fast, um, big and fast data maturity models that we're going to go over during this session. So, Andrew, you want to start? Sure, excellent. Um, well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Andy Montgomery. I lead the information assets and data team at Monsanto. So think about that for a second. It's uh, really our data practice um, for everything from strategy around our data, the build of our data ecosystem, as well as sort of the operational run. Um, sort of really the, the thing to take away from us, what we do maybe a little bit differently, is that we think about data as a product, and we sort of encapsulate those data products as a platform in terms of our overall delivery of IT solutions for Monsanto. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cliff Gilmore. Uh, up until recently, I was the uh, practice director for data engineering at 1904 Labs. Uh, I have recently joined Confluent, which is the company behind Apache Kafka. Um, I would best describe myself as an architect. I, I help design modern data architectures and uh, platforms for uh, solving today's business problems and so forth. Hi, I'm Laura Tellman, and I'm with BJC Healthcare and Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, my background is in anything really related to data, so right now I'm doing uh, enterprise data governance for both BJC and the medical school, and in the past I've done data integration, uh, data broker services, um, and apps that are collecting data. Um, thank you. I think I got the short end of the mic here. Um, so I'm Jeffrey Phillips. Uh, I'm over enterprise architecture at uh, Centene, uh, as well as a couple of our strategic platforms that are focused on API and uh, real-time data. Um, I have, uh, you know, been in healthcare IT for 20 plus years, both on the, you know, what you call the provider or the doctor side, as well as the payer side. Um, you know, my primary role at Centene is really to help uh, each of the different teams connect, you know, with it, business and IT, partnering together so people process and technology and, and kind of help innovate. Uh, we have lots of buildings, as you've probably noticed, around St. Louis. Um, mine is not, my groups are not in any of the places where you would normally see a sign. Um, we're down at the uh, Cortex area um, at the CIC. So. Excellent. Okay, so to get started, Cliff, we're going to transport you back into the days of 1904 Labs. And can you just give us a little bit of an overview of this maturity model? Certainly. So to, uh, to put a frame around what the maturity model is, it's a, a, a series of steps and levels that help understand where in the journey um, your data architecture and data platforms are and uh, provide strategies, technologies, and uh, designs to be able to move forward in the maturity. So uh, a good uh, description of what it's all about is everyone's at a different place. There's companies that have moved all to the cloud using all open source technologies or a mix of open source and proprietary technologies um, to those who are mostly on premises in their own data centers and just starting down the journey to being able to solve the new business problems. Um, a lot of it is about understanding how we can get from just handling simple transactions and you know business data to getting to the new world where we have a completely integrated customer experience where when somebody calls in we want to be able to understand everything about their interactions with my business, every touch point, every customer service call, every purchase, and put analytics and put understanding around that. And in order to get to that journey, there's a lot of different steps that are required. There's everything from the cultural change, which is the old way of doing data where we have a bunch of silos with applications built 
just to solve a single business problem, has to go away. We can't build modern uh, capabilities around that environment. We need to be able to um, bring data together, expose it to different lines of businesses so that they can um, enrich their applications that they're developing uh, to solve these problems. Everything from the Internet of Things, which is just huge volumes and velocities, to, you know, when somebody's on the app for my, uh, my business. I want to be able to understand who they are, where they've been, what they've bought, um, what they're likely to buy. And we want to be, have to be able to do that quickly. So, you know, the last few years has been all about the buzz of big data, right? What are the insights we can find in the, the data lake or the data uh, that we've collected as a business? The next step is understanding how to act on that to take the insights generated there to enhance the experience of our customers or our internal users or our applications on the edge in the field. Um, so the maturity model takes you through the, the different steps and some, you know, components of what that architecture looks like. To, to start down that journey or to pick up that journey where you are and become a data innovator, right? So it's, it's not everyone's need to be Google or Uber or Facebook or LinkedIn, but it's, uh, there's different steps on that level and getting to that point would be the goal of any industry that's being disrupted by one of those companies. Thank you. So in thinking about that, we're going to go to the other three panelists and actually talk about where you are at your company on this maturity model. And then we have some questions about that really on how you move forward. So Andy, why don't we start with you and Monsanto and your perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so when we sit down and, and, and think about where we're at, where we're going, um, and what we're really trying to do if we think about data as a product, um, you know, we've been through many of these, these elements uh, across functions and as it's the enterprise as a whole. Um, I, I would say today, you know, we're, we're really trying to land and bridge from four into five. Uh, where we're really thinking about how do we take all those silos of information um, and, and really unify them behind a single sort of canonical representation uh, and really expose it out for broader data science usage, digital products, um, as well as sort of just basic insights to help run our company better. And so that's really where, where we see ourselves in that four camp, um, really bridging and driving and pushing our company into to level five. And then Laura? BJC. Right. So um, at BJC, we are, I'm going to say that we're at three bridging into four, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think that is. So um, we um, were more of a holding company as opposed to an enterprise system, and so we were best of breed until about five years ago. So we had many, many, many applications all trying to be integrated together. I, I can't remember the number. At some point it was like 440 different just clinical apps trying to be integrated. So what we're doing is um, standardizing our operational systems and some of those are in the cloud and some of them are on premise. And so that's been very helpful from a data perspective. Um, and then in addition to that, we're um, doing master data management in a couple of different areas. Patient is one that we've been doing for a while, but we're also moving into the provider space. Um, and our location, which has been really interesting. Me being a little bit of an optimist, I thought, location, how hard can that be? Hmm. Um, so, uh, so that's where we are there. In terms of our warehousing, we still have a lot of warehouses, and but they are trying to sort of crystallize around certain functions, and we are going to dabble next year with two of those going into the cloud. Oops. Yeah. We're going to have to lose that water. Maybe that way. So I'm not sure I would uh, put a number on on one of ours. Um, there's there's um, a couple of small pockets where I'd say we're we're a five, and then there's some others where we're a one. Frankly, um, uh, so where we would like to be, obviously, is is much more. Um, you know, I don't know if we need to get all the way to five for all of our different data sets and for all of our lines of business, but um, moving to a four, I think, would be the, the kind of sweet spot for us um, so that we can, you know, um, make sure that we, we have data available because that's, that's almost our, our most important uh, intellectual property is our data and how we treat it, how we protect it, and how we share it uh, with the right people. 
Thank you. Why don't you keep the mic there and then okay. we'll just go back. We'll just so, so with that, you think about where you are on what you've built, what you have, and then things happen like you acquire a new company, you, you know, get a new hospital, something like that, and they may not be at the same stage in their, um, with their data that you are and what you've built. So how do each of you address that challenge? In, in whatever capacity you are in your company, let's put it that way. Right. Um, so I would say that's very um, near and dear to us at this point. Um, we've uh, merged with a company the same size out in California, uh, and we're still merging. Um, you know, in, in very different um, IT philosophies, different IT practices, and so it's been difficult, um, or challenging, I won't say difficult, uh, to make sure that we can find all of the data and start to work towards, you know, that, that canonical model um, and trying to kind of get it into, to, you know, a cohesive environment. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, you know, our data scientists, our, our you know, analytics teams, they're spending 80% of their time uh, scrubbing data and pulling data and extracting data. And, you know, we, we definitely want to get, you know, past that so that we can move to the next level uh, because that's, that's a lot of wasted time um, that, w that we don't have at this point with the growth that we've had. So I think there's really sort of two big things that are moving us along in terms of driving our maturity. One is mergers and acquisitions because hospital systems are going through a lot of that right now. For the most part, our, our processes around that are to get them onto our standard operating systems first. Um, because most of those we've already built good interfaces to are warehousing and other analytics um, environments. So that's sort of our strategy around the mergers and acquisitions. The other one that's a bit more challenging right now is the move from fee-for-service to, um, you know, pay for performance and being much more aware about who your population is, what all their issues are, what are their social statuses, how are you going to get outside of the critical acute care space and into every aspect of their lives so that you can keep them healthy. So there um, is where we're trying the cloud-based analytics products being offered and um, hoping that we can link our data in much the way that retailers and other people have been doing for years so that we can understand the bigger picture of the patients. You know, so for us, you know, we're, in, we're actually in the middle of a uh, pretty large, very public um, uh, acquisition uh, being acquired uh, by buyer. And, and I, while I can't go into those specific details, I would say just a couple sort of high level uh, things that we think about as we're thinking about data and, and that activity. Um, and really, I look about where we've been. So in the last, you know, year and a pl year and plus, uh, we've been going through a pretty large transformation about how we expose information um, for our internal consumption as well as support our digital products externally to, to Monsanto. Um, and so that's, that's forced us to think about how we steward our data differently, um, putting teams, not just people who wear that role as a secondary hat, but put teams together that really focus governing and cleansing and bringing the right business rules together as we build that canonical model of our information. And then really, the engineering teams have been building these data sets that are spanning across functions and across business. Um, that work alone is making the conversations we're trying to have around our integration um, much easier because we've already gone through a lot of the thrashing, if you will, around what, what it means to be a customer or what it means around your material data. Things that we would need to do from a master data management perspective, um, there are already things we've already been focusing on. So it's making that conversation easier um, and helping us uh, be, hopefully be more successful. Thank you. Cliff, did you have any other thoughts? Sure. I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in, in those environments to bring data together. So you're going through a merger, you're bringing companies together. Uh, there's an opportunity that's kind of unique there, which is often it's, there's a high barrier to entry of, um, you know, building a new system, replacing an existing architecture, onboarding uh, new data sets in a way that are accessible through the organization. Then now that environment is going to give you an opportunity to do that uh, because 
because y you can either double your technical debt of the two organizations or you know multiply it, which is probably more common, um, or you can decide that, hey, this is the opportunity that we're going to have the, the finances to combine these systems. Let's, let's design something that's future-proof, is gonna solve today's problems, tomorrow's problems from a data perspective as a foundation for uh, your combined business. All right. Why don't you pass this one to Laura and we'll start with her. So I want to move from acquisitions and mergers to let's think about how you use the data. So the data can be used operationally, right, to make decisions. And I'm starting with you, Laura, because you work in a, a, the healthcare industry, which there's life or death decisions that are made based on real-time data. And then there are there's the need to do research and development on the data for other times, which you may or may not need real-time data for. But can you talk a little bit about how you separate out the operations versus the R&D and what's needed in your thought process? So. Um I think for the most part, we're trying to build models where the operational systems like the ERP, the electronic health record, um, the finance systems are gonna handle what they need to handle when they don't need to integrate data, right? So they should supply the operational needs that don't need all the connections to everything else. But I get involved in the, in the bigger challenges where we're trying to integrate that data in order to do things. And just to give you some examples, um, the sorts of things that we're doing in real time are, for example, screening every drug that is prescribed within the hospital within 10 seconds to make sure that we're actually prescribing the right drug to you. And that means that you know we're looking both at your clinical data to make sure that your body can accept that drug. We're looking at the history of drugs that you've received to make sure there's gonna be no interactions on that drug, those sorts of things. So in, in with that, we are having to um, pull this data together, which today is still across, I think it's 240 different clinical systems, right? In real time in order to put the decision support on top of it and, and build those sorts of clinical alerts. So that's just an idea of what's going on on sort of the operational sides from, from the clinical perspective. Um, another big one in terms of our operations is um, uh, the number of denials that we deal with. So claims processing, although very electronic and has been around for a very long time, the rules and all the things that you have to be in place to make sure that that claim actually processes is getting much more complex. And so, and we have a huge effort right now around trying to make sure that when we submit a claim, we only have to submit it once. That's being optimistic, of course. Um, okay, then on the research side, you don't, we don't have to worry as much about the latency of the data in some of our situations, right? So obviously if you're on the research side and you're trying to find the right people to be in a clinical trial, you still need that sort of real-time data. But a lot of it is looking at past and post sorts of things, right? So who, whether or not I should do a study should be based on what my population looks like and the number of patients I think I'll be able to recruit into a trial. That's your historical data, so making sure that that stays up to date and um, can be utilized and accessed by people. That's, that's a big area of effort for us because a lot of our research data we partner with the medical school on, and so getting these two non-legal organizations to share data and to do it in such a way that you know benefits both sides is, is an interesting um, opportunity. Is that what we're, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think just to add on to what Laura was saying, um, you know, I, I try to think of of data in, in three different ways, right? There's the the past, uh, present, and future. The past is your historical. That's your badge. I need to do. I still need to do compliance reporting. I still need to look at historical trends. Um, I, I use that that kind of batch data as well to kind of predict the future. So sometime in the future, we know that um, you know one of our members is going to go into the hospital for you know some condition because we, we've looked at the the history. Um, but 
but the, the fast data, the real-time data, it's what do I need to do right now? I've got you know, one of our members, one of your patients on the phone, what do I need to do right now? And um, that's a very different model. That's not looking at um, you know, the past data, but it is using what I've collected, what I've aggregated, what I've analyzed um, to, to say for this one piece of information, I can bounce that up against the model and say this is what I need to do right now. So we, we kind of coin, you know, we use a, a term, next best action, what do I need to do right now? And then what's the next one and then what's the next one? Um, and it's, it's very different to kind of look at all of that fast data, you know, the velocity side of, of big data and say what is, what is that one thing I need to pull out of there and, and really use? Um, so that's where we start talking about, you know, the streaming data uh, as a part of the Lambda architecture, so. Thank you. And moving over to Monsanto. Yeah, you know, for us, you know, it, being, being in a, an industry like ag, you, you wouldn't think there's a lot of fast data going on, but the reality is the, the components that require you to sort of take a, something like a corn seed and plant it and get it to where it needs to be in a cycled time is, is extremely a challenging problem. Um, so elements of streaming data that we leverage to do that starts with literally just knowing where we drop the seed into the field, knowing then when it gets harvested and streaming those events. And every time you touch the seed all the way to the point where it gets processed is an event we're listening for. So we can do things like monitoring truck traffic. Uh, we can tell our facilities when a truck's going to arrive. They can start preparing the people so that the time that they need to process that, that seed as it's coming out of that truck um, can be minimized. And we can maximize the time we do for processing. We can maximize um, decisions around which seed we should you know, move into which bags to move to eventually which customers. Um, operationally, that's, that requires that level of feed. If we waited um, and did things historically in batch, um, we could be sitting and waiting for, um, for hours to process that. And you can imagine the trucks that would just back up at these facilities. Um, in research, we have different problems, but they're similar problems, right? Um, using um, really sophisticated harvesters, um, we don't have, you know, you know, tens of thousands of harvesters all around the United States in, in, in this geography, let alone the other geographies. So we have to really optimize um, the proper usage and placement of those. So we use streaming data around where the harvesters are, what challenges they're facing in the field, streaming that back in such a way that we can analyze the proper placement and, and movement of those harvesters across, literally from the top of the United States geographically, down as appropriate within the right, what we call RM bands or regions of, of growing places so that we can optimize the right usage of those harvesters or entire research organization. So um, we're honestly, when we think about data, um, we're, we try to really think of batch second. Batch is a mechanism to stage data for, say, um, data lear for learning of our analytical models and really think of everything we're doing is, is streaming. Using streaming almost as a mechanism for ETL now, rather than using um, a batch, um, you know, everything runs that, you know, everybody knows they got their eight o'clock job, their nine o'clock job, their, their 4 a.m. job, and you hope that those jobs are all done by 7 a.m. Um, so when someone comes in and turns on something, um, that they get their data, right? We're, we're using streaming as much through those processes as possible so that we know that as soon as an event occurs that that data didn't make it, we can respond right there in flight rather than waiting until the batch gets done to, to manage it. Cliff? Sure. So I, I think that that's a, a really great point, which is that um, a, as the maturity of your, your architecture evolves, you get to the point where batch starts to become just an abstraction on top of streaming, whereas you're looking at data as a flow of events, and you're capturing those events first, worry, considering them as events, and then you can work on them in different technology platforms. So I can use a Hadoop environment to do, to do more batch on them, or I can use a NoSQL environment to serve them out to the rest of the org in a scalable way. I can use stream processing algorithms I can in, in into that workflow to make decisions based on what I calculated in my batch layer. So uh, a perfect example of that would be, say, I, I'm on a retailer's website. I'm going to order something. Well, they're not only looking at your past history, the, the past history of people like you, serving that information out to their stream processing engine in a way that 
says, this person is very likely to buy these items. But let's also look at their last five clicks on the website so we know um, what context to do. And, and let's, let's look at their location. And you know, maybe it's snowing in their city, so maybe I should put snow gear on there if I'm selling apparel. And, and trying to bring all those different workflows together requires a, a, a little bit of a rethink in how you move data and how you capture it in the organization because we've got different tools for different problems. We've got big batch tools, we have fast access tools, we have stream processing tools, um, but they all need the same data. If our data is not captured and staged in an event manner to serve those uh, environments, you're going to be battling uh, you know, a network of ETL jobs in the old way that uh, will be very fragile. So it's very important to think about that uh, usage of data and not see those as independent environments that don't work together and are different organizations that just kind of throw things over the wall at each other. It becomes very important to think about that entire workflow of data and how it gets mixed together when you design your next generation systems and think about how to, to build out those capabilities both on top of what you already have and incrementally improve on that. And that, that ties back into the maturity model, which is, you know, First, we have to crawl before we run, so let's, let's expose our data really quickly, let's start playing with some early stream processing in isolation, and then start tying it into our systems and, and creating services to expose it and so forth. It's a, it's a journey to get to that point where we've mixed it big and fast and stream processing and random access all together with the same view of the same data with all the uh, insight and um, data science that's been enriching that information. You, you have to build up to that, and that's that's really what uh, what a modern architecture is about is is enabling that journey. Okay, thank you. So one next stream, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So be thinking of your questions. Is really, you know, this is a process, thinking about it, setting up an infrastructure, but all of that is completed by people, by. And, and we're all in the St. Louis region. So I'd like to explore a little bit about how you find the talent that you need, any perhaps onboarding that you may or may not do, and then really what's needed in order to facilitate this type of thinking so that we can leverage our data more quickly than, than what we are now. So Andy, why don't, since the microphone's close to you, why don't we start there? Sure. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. Talent is a, is a challenge in this space, and, and honestly, it's, it's a challenge not only because of um, of the type of work, it, you know, working with data. That's not necessarily something that everyone sort of wakes up and realizes they want to do one day. Um, it's also that even with data, right, the technologies around the data stack is fundamentally changing. In fact, they look more like a software stack in a lot of ways than they look like a traditional data stack, um, which adds complexity. So if you take someone who says, "I'm a data guy or gal," uh, you know, and, and and ask them what they do, they may describe that I manage relational databases or I help create data visualizations in, a, in a, some BI platform. Um, the reality is those are skills we still need, but those only make up about you know, 15 to 25 percent of the skills we are looking for in, um, in, in, a, in a new candidate. And so, um, yeah, we have to look at different avenues. We need to interview differently. We need to interview people, like give them tech, techs, tech tests that look more like how to build a, a back-end software solution than necessarily a, a data solution. Um, because we realize the, when you're trying to create services on, on top of every piece of information you have, you have to have those skills. You have to think about data, not just in the massive sense of everything that's in this system, but think about the data in flight um, and the data in its usage um, as well. And so those require a different uh, frame of reference. So we look at different pipelines of talent, different partnerships um, within the community. Um, we tackle schools differently. We don't just look for people that are maybe MIS. We look for as much CS and everything else and, and any other sort of um, channel. We look at groups like um, like Launch Code and so forth that, sort of, that are helping embed modern tech sk stack skills into resources um, as, a, as a leapfrog into other, other avenues as well. So um, it's a challenge and, and honestly one I think um, we as a community are doing pretty well in, um, in, in St. Louis. I see us continuing driving innovation through the startup groups, um, through different um, uh, knowledge groups that are, that are forming, um, and, and I, I look forward to more and more dialogue around how we continue to elevate that, um, that skill across the board. So I do think it is a challenge. Um, 
I'll talk about a couple of the things that we're doing. So first of all, we think a lot about partnerships and consulting help um, because a lot of what we're doing is very new and we don't want to try to go through it um, on our own at the, at the speed with which we could try to do it on our own. And so partnerships and consulting um, help has become pretty core to um, our work. One of the things we try to do there is if it's something that we want to improve our skill on, we make sure we write into the contract how that's going to happen. So that transfer of knowledge between that partnership or that consulting firm and to our own individuals is part of the contract. So that's one area. Um, in terms of building our own you know, recruiting process and onboarding process, at least for me, I'm of the mind that my people may not stay long. The people who will stay with me are the ones that just really are passionate about changing healthcare. But if you're driven by many or other motivators, you're not gonna stay with me, but it doesn't mean that I don't want you um, as an employee. So we've really looked at clarifying what the roles and responsibilities are, being very clear about what an onboarding process and what a training um, can look for, or, or should look like, and then finding out who can help us train people. So looking at different avenues for where you can get the training that you need as opposed to trying to build it all in-house. And then, you know, like many people, you build very clear 90-day plans so that people understand what's expected of them and sort of you can see if they're ramping fast, right? Because if not, then you know you need to do something different with that. Um, then uh, I guess those are really the two main points. I was going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the other softer skills, but um, I think I covered it. So, thank you. So I don't. I don't. I think the only thing I would add, because I think we're all fairly similar, um, is well, first, Centina's hiring. Uh, just so <laughs> you all know, uh, we're growing and we continue to grow. Um, so a big part of it is is really getting the Centene name out there that we are a, a St. Louis-based headquartered company. Um, when I started with Centene, you know, 10 years ago, you know, people were like, is that a, a bubble gum or something, Centene? No, that's Dentine. Um, so <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's been great to see, you know, getting a little bit more name brand recognition, doing these types of things and, and talking with the community as much as possible, I think helps out so that people can kind of see the that we have a lot of the same shared goals. I think importantly for STEM individuals is giving them a challenge. Um, if they know they have a challenge and we're, we're here to offer them a challenge and you know we can provide a supportive environment for that challenge um, that's very attractive to people um, you know in in the field that we're in and I, I think that's probably the most important thing if if people are bored or you know they have to do cobalt or something like that um, you know they're probably not going to be too happy um, so no bash on cobalt <laughs> Thank you. Okay, are there questions from the audience? I don't, yes. Before you kind of started this dialogue, I work with training data science people. Um, what do you guys do to train and keep your employees, your stakeholders current? Uh, trial and error, degrees, seminars, how do you do it? So I think a combination of those things. I think probably the thing that we do the most is we've got an onboarding process that, I mean, literally, in, in our data broker space, I think we have three new hires about every six months. And so we've had to build a really good onboarding process for these people. And um, so we make sure that we are hitting the things that we want them to learn and we do it partnered with something they have to deliver, right? Um, so that they are productive, usually within the first six weeks. I mean, they are. We, we start them out with writing queries, right? And you just say, look, um, within for this first six weeks, you're going to be doing these queries, and then we just move them on to other things as we um, want to position them. But the other things we're looking for, which gets to your point, is um, we want to partner with educational systems and people who are building these data science training programs and bring a little bit of it in-house, right? So bring a little bit of those training programs into our space, but also find ones where we can send people for additional training depending on what we're looking for. Cliff, do you want to add anything just from the 1904 perspective? 
So I think that uh, in terms of developing your, your talent, it's uh, a few different ways of looking at it. Um, one is people learn by doing. So uh, providing the opportunity and the environment for engineers to get a problem and find a way to solve it in a reasonable manner and not be told the how of to do it will help develop their skills internally. Um, it allows them to go out and uh, you know do the research, join the community, go to meetups, talk to other practitioners doing it. And it allows the, the, the talent to develop uh, more organically because what from what I've seen is there's not going to be a huge base of people with these technologies on, under their belt today. I mean, it's just the, the nature of the Midwest. It's the nature of, uh, you know, the, the West Coast is kind of pulling everyone in that, that's in this space. So it really is about empowering your people to have the opportunity to get their hands on with these technologies and, you know, uh, fail fast with them, you know, rapidly iterate over the, uh, the, the problems they're trying to solve. And, and then, go out and share that information with the community. So here's what we learned, here's what worked, here's what didn't, um, so that they can get together with other like-minded people. Also, it, it's a great way to show um, that it's an interesting place to work, because if, if your engineers or your architects are out there talking about uh, the problems they're solving, obviously there's data they can't share, but they can talk about the te technology challenges. It allows that um, uh, you know kind of self-recruiting uh, effect to take, uh, take hold, because uh, the engineers really are motivated by challenge, or at least the, one, the ones I know that, that are building these platforms are motivated by challenge, and it, it really is about empowering them to solve the problems with the right tools um, and not telling them the how. It's telling them what uh, and letting them run with it. All right, thank you. Question, yes. So this question is for Jeff. If I heard you right, um, given this maturity model, you said you're not aspiring to be by. I'm curious. So the question is to Jeff when he said that he wasn't aspiring to be a five on the maturity model. And so talk more about that. So I, I think I said it maybe a little bit different. Um, <laughs> there's a nuance, right? Um, uh, not aspiring to be a five across the board, right? So if you've heard the Gartner bimodal, you know, kind of uh, speech, um, you know, our systems of record you know, we're not looking to necessarily innovate on there. We don't want a lot of fast change. We don't want to, you know, innovate, you know, something that's very, you know, rigid and, and solid. Um, whereas, you know, for some of our more innovative parts of, of IT and of our business, that's really where we want to uh, strive to be a five. So it's, it's not something that we want to necessarily be across the board. Maybe we'll get there, but, you know, I just think that our sweet spot is much more on a four. Um, you know, with lots of pockets of fives um, that are there when they need to be. Um, you know, just thinking of that composability is such a big thing when you're growing and you're expanding your lines of business, and that, that really means that you're going to need pockets of those that then can assemble re really quickly and, and be able to, you know, supplement with your, uh, you know, systems of record type things. All right, thank you. Good question. Yep. Yeah, sure. I know the question. I realize the question was specifically to you, Jeff, but I do have a, a point of view that I, I thought would be good to share with the um, with the group today. Um, you know, in our data strategy, we've broken our data elements into five key areas, and in and, and one of those fives, we call Company 360. And, and it's sort of um, ask yourself why Company 360 is predominantly made up of transactional data, maybe data out of your ERP, could be data specifically your master data. Um, the, the reason why we give that that asset as much focus as we give some of the other ones that are certainly more connected to our business sort of way of operating and our, and our science is that as we've discovered in, in, in our drive to push more and more uh, the barrier on analytics is the notion that we have to be able to connect um, the elements of, 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 that, of those analytics to the understanding of our financials or the understanding of our, our people data, or the understanding of our um, some of the core transactional things that are happening even within our supply chain. And that you can't really understand and equate the, the value proposition or where you need to make nuanced changes in the model without having that data there. So while we're not innovating necessarily in how we store that core transactional element, we're exposing it in a way that's, uh, that's fundamentally different than really anything that we've ever done as a company before um, because of that linkage and in, in, in opportunity it has within analytics. All right, thank you. I think the gentleman in the white shirt had his hand up early. Yes, that's you. 
Can you talk about the differences between the streaming tools like Kafka and versus the traditional OAMQs uh, in terms of use cases? So yes. if we can repeat I'll the repeat question. It, yeah. Okay. So the question is, what is the difference between traditional messaging technologies and, and event processing systems and the emerging open source solutions in that space? So a lot of it has to do with uh, being able to look at information in a persistent way. A lot of times messaging was, you know, I, I publish a message to a, a messaging infrastructure, it gets consumed and it's gone. Um, the, the future of stream processing is very much about looking at the stream as my my data master, or it's not the content master, but it's the, the source of truth for events. Um, and so what new technologies are looking at is there's a lot of different components of uh, a modern streaming architecture. There's looking at aggregations and batches of time. There's looking at events as a one-off. So like Kafka is very much about looking at individual events and doing stream processing on those, but also looking back and, uh, you know, enriching that with data from other event streams. Um, whereas, you know, in the more big data ecosystem, there's Spark and Spark Streaming, which are more about, you know, let's say I'm trading stocks. Well, what is the, the roll up of the stock trades in the last hour? And then persisting that somewhere else for either analytics or, you know, a terminal or something like that. Um, and then there's technologies that are more about um, the data science side. So that would be Flink. Um, uh, and you know, being able to embed actual algorithms and actual decision-making processes into the stream. So sessionization, looking at different uh, uh, dimensions of the data as it flows through. But really, the, the core principle of today versus the past is eventing was just a way for data to get from one place to another in the past. Now the event is the, the source. So the, the actual events are what we operate on, what we process, and so forth. Thank you. All right, I'll take one from this side. Yes. Yeah, for, for anybody who wants to do an answer, I'll also help here. But uh, one of the challenges we found is with data quality and data duration. Uh, the big challenge in healthcare with everything is providers, clinical um, coding, things like that. Uh, as we've shifted from a batch processing to more of a stream processing, we're going to have a big fan of Kafka, by the way. Um, it's really put challenges on our ability to curate data effectively um, because often you're having to do that long term scroll comparison to understand why is this condition coding something in this way instead of coding this way. I'm just curious as to whether you all have run into um, particular challenges and how you might approach those or solve those to get um, good quality data out of these. Yeah, so um, definitely have experienced issues with data quality, and I would say that I think the biggest thing we're doing is the data governance around that, and, um, you know, spoke, he spoke about it a little bit earlier. We are aligning stewards within the organization that, you know, it's not their full-time job, but we're making it very clear that there are people who are responsible for the quality of the data. And we've got stewards, and then we've got what we like to call trustees, which are like VP-level people in the organization that are now going to be held accountable for the data that they are trustees of. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that we're doing that I believe will improve the quality of our data, is by just making it clear who's the throat to choke and who's the person to talk to when you have a problem. Um, because currently it just gets passed around, right? The business side thinks it's an IT problem, the IT side thinks it's a business problem, and the thing just circles around and circles around and circles around. So the way that we've been able to, I think, make a really good um, change is by creating this responsibility matrix. So I'd say a little bit different. So I don't have 240 clinical databases. Wow, I couldn't even imagine that. But um, you know, our problem is not necessarily. Um, so we're mainly health insurance for government-based programs. We can't go and choke a state's throat, right? That's not. <laughs> that's our partner, right? So we get you know variety of different data that is of you know questionable quality. Um, <laughs> you know, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> And uh, as well, we, we also try to partner with hospitals and our providers. And again, um, you know, we want to partner. We don't want to, you know, necessarily disenfranchise them. So we, we deal with a lot with uh, bad data. Um, 
we spend a lot of time cleaning it up, uh, is all we do right now. Where I see it going, and there's probably a, a level six or seven cliff, um, which is you know starting to look at some of the AI and, and the mediated you know APIs that can figure this stuff out on its own. Because what what are we basically doing? We're we're looking at it and we're saying, well, this kind of lines up and that kind of lines up, so we need to clean it. Wouldn't it be great if if we could all do that with you know some of the automated you know AI type things? And and so that's some of the things we're dabbling in, um, you know, for some of the more you know, structured data. The unstructured data, you know, now we're talking NLP and, you know, some of that other uh, types of uh, things to, to clean it up in advance uh, beforehand. So it's not an easy answer in healthcare by any means. Um, so. Thank you. Okay, so we just have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to turn it to Cliff to kind of wrap this up. Sure. And so um, on your handout that we, we put on the, the seats, there is a link to a landing page that has the full version of the maturity model. So if you'd like to dig further into that and ask questions, that's the place to go for that. Um, also, there will be a, a follow-up panel later in this year, which is focusing on using specific use cases or your first use cases to drive building the platform through this maturity model. So how to get from where you are today to an in-state platform in the context of business short-term requirements and how to iterate over those to get to an in-state that is looking like a four or a five on the maturity model. All right, so that'll be in September, correct? Yeah. All right, well, why don't we thank our panelists, Andy, Cliff, Laura, and Jeff, thank you.